Good morning. Well, I'm not going to take too long because we have a, a, uh, a speaker today who's going to be presenting in a special manner. I want to give him as much time as he can. So our, uh, our marketing director is uh, Mr. Sean LePage. He's going to be bringing, bringing the message today. Give it up for, for uh, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you to all of you. Uh, for welcoming me and my family into the Calvary community over the past nine months or so. We greatly appreciate that. And I want to ask, well, let's begin with prayer, actually. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege of serving you, and we ask that you would lead and guide, that you would have your way, and that you would be glorified as we seek to follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to use your imaginations this morning, your biblical Christian imagination. Do you have one? Can you raise your hand if you have a biblical Christian imagination? I hope you use that when you study the scriptures, but we'll talk about that another time. This morning, I want you to imagine for me what it was like when the churches of the first century received a letter from Peter or John or Paul. Imagine how they, they must have gathered together and, and read it together and reread it and discussed it and prayed about it. So I want you to imagine that this morning. I also want you to imagine what it was like for the first century church when persecution broke out, when persecution uh, took some of those apostles from the movement of the churches and... Um, so just imagine what it was like for the leaders in the churches as they began to hear about uh, their leaders being martyred, okay? Can you do that? I want you to begin, I want you to participate with me, I want you to begin by pretending, by imagining that you have been called to a gathering of the churches in a region. Let's say Timothy has called the churches to a gathering and you come, and you're here, that's why you're here this morning, is because you've come to a gathering of the churches during a time of intense persecution, and you get to see brothers and sisters in Christ that you haven't seen for years, and you weren't even sure if they were alive or dead because of the persecution. Can you imagine that? All right? So when I say go, I want you to stand up and greet one another with that scenario in your heads. All right, can you do that for me? Can you do that for me? Go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry to, so sorry to interrupt. I know it's always a wonderful time when we gather together as churches, but I'm afraid that today is not going to be one of those joyful times. I appreciate you all coming. I know some of you have come great distances. Um, but as many of you know, I, I have come, I've just, I've just uh, returned from Rome with Onesiphorus and Prisca and Aquila, and I'm afraid, brothers, we, we have some very bad news. Uh, and I don't know how to say it, I, I, I've thought about how to, how to tell you all this but I, I, just, I just need to say it. So, my brothers and sisters, our brother, our, our teacher, the Apostle Paul, was martyred at the hands of the Romans. So, I'm so sorry to have to be 
the one to tell you this. Um, I thought about it as we fled Rome for our, uh, for our lives, as we, as we prayed and as we grieved, as we traveled, I, I thought about this, like, what would I say, what will I say to the churches? How will I tell them? And after I've told you, what do I say now? So I, I as I was praying about this, I remembered something. I remembered that Paul had written me a letter just a few months ago. And as I thought about this letter, so see, when he sent it to me, I just, I just read it. And he asked me to come to Rome, so I read the letter and I, I tucked it in my bag and I, and I left for Rome as soon as I could. So I, I didn't think much about this letter other than that, but as I prayed and as I thought about this day, uh, of telling you this news, I, I realized that this letter that Paul sent me, his last letter, he was preparing me for his death. He was preparing us for his death. And so I just want to read, I just want to read this for you because I believe that if he was here, this is what he would say to us. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even, <laughs> even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. <laughs> For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains." But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David according to, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things. And solemnly charged them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will." But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make, their, make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jonas and Jambres' folly was also. Now, you followed my teaching. Conduct, purpose, faith, Patience, love, 
perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me, from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. So you see, brothers, if Paul was here, this is what he would say to us. Paul's been doing this. He he, he would tell us to continue the ministry of the gospel by entrusting the faith to faithful men and women who will teach others also, regardless of the cost. That's what Paul has been doing. That's what Paul has been doing. For 30 or 40 years, Paul has been doing this. Everywhere he went, he continued in the faith of the... to do the ministry of the gospel. He would, he would go someplace and he would preach the gospel at, at, 
at great danger to his life, and then he, anyone who believed, he would bring them together, and he would, he would plant a church, and then he would strengthen that church, and then he would raise up leaders and, and appoint elders, and then he would move on and do it somewhere else. He continued. He continued. And he did this by, also by, by entrusting the work to, to other faithful men. To, to, to men like Silas and, and Luke and, and Titus and, and me. I don't know if I've ever told you about how I started traveling with Paul. I was young. I don't remember how young. But what I remember is that I had hair, a lot of hair, and none here, only a few whiskers. So I was young. But Paul came to visit us, and, and uh, he taught us, and he strengthened our church. And then one evening, my mother came to me with Paul and with the elders of our church. And she said, Timothy, Paul wants you to go with him, to be his apprentice. And if you are willing, I'm prepared to give you my blessing. And the elders said the same thing. And then Paul said, Timothy, the people here speak very highly of you. And he began to tell me some of the things that they said. And then he said, just, I want you to pray about this. And I did. And then I went to my mother and I told her I was willing to go. And in the gathering that, that week, they laid hands on me and prayed for me. And they sent me off. And before I knew it, I was walking down the road with the Apostle Paul. And I don't think I said a word for the first year. I think I, ju I just listened and I watched. And then one time Paul said, when we get to this next city, I want you to proclaim the gospel, Timothy. And I was terrified, but I did. I had heard Paul say it so many times, I just, it just came out. And people believed. And we planted a church. And other times, another time, Paul said, uh, Timothy, I want you to stay here in Ephesus, and I'm going to go to Corinth, and I, I want you to stay, and I want you to put in order everything that remains to be done. I want you to appoint elders, and, and then I want you to, to meet me in Corinth. And, and other times, he would send me to, to churches that were having problems. Some of you remember this. <laughs> uh, I, I, I went, and I helped you sort through your problems and your divisions and, and help you become strong and one-minded. And so my point is that over the years, Paul gave me more and more responsibility. He, entr he was entrusting the ministry to me over time. And no matter the cost. Brothers, Paul continued with this ministry no matter what it cost him. I'll never forget shortly after I started traveling with him that we went to Philippi and in Philippi, he was beaten with rods, and he was thrown in prison. We thought he was going to die, but he survived. And as we left Philippi, Silas was begging him to rest and to heal. But Paul marched right into Thessalonica, and he boldly declared the gospel there too. He continued no matter what it cost him. And that's what he said in this letter. If he was here, he would say, continue in the ministry of the gospel by entrusting the faith to, to other faithful men, older men and women teaching the younger men and women, no matter what it costs. He said, join me in suffering for the gospel. Listen to this once more. He said, for I am being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. See, he knew. He knew he was going to die. He said, I have fought the good fight. Are you prepared to fight the good fight? I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Are you ready? Are you prepared? He said, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And listen, 
not only to me. See, it wasn't about Paul. It was about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about Timothy. It's not. It's not about Silas. It's not about Titus. It's not about Catherine. Right? It's not about Adam. It's not about Hannah or Abigail. It's not about Norm. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And will we be faithful in our time? He said that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Brothers and sisters, love his appearing. I want to pray for you now. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the ministry of Paul. And now we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to continue in the faith, to continue in the ministry of the gospel. We pray that you would raise up many young believers who will be faithful to learn the ministry of the gospel and continue the ministry and to, and to teach others also, no matter the cost. We pray that you would spare us suffering, but even if you ask that of us, we pray that you would be glorified as we serve you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sean. So, why, why did you decide to speak the, this message in the first person of Timothy? Um, there's, a, there's probably a lot of things involved with that. Um, I, my hope is, uh, let me tell a story. <laughs> I went to Dallas Seminary, and I was there. I squeezed in a four-year uh, degree in five years, and so uh, we had to go to chapel as well. And I don't know how many chapel messages I heard. I, I couldn't even guess. Uh, that's math, and I'm not good at that. Um, but of all those messages, and it's been a while now, but of all those messages, I could only remember one, maybe two or three. But the one that stuck out to me was, um, you know, just like here, uh, the seminary invited guests to come in and speak. And uh, one day they invited a black pastor from the Dallas area to come in, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but he did a sermon from the mouth of Hosea. And I was totally captivated by it. He didn't have a costume. He was in a suit and tie. He stood right behind the pulpit the whole time, but it was just fantastic. And... I've, I've, uh, I was thinking about that recently when you asked me to speak, and I was just thinking, well, it's been a long year, right? A lot of chapel messages. If we, if, we, if we had a quiz on chapel messages this year, how would you guys do? I, I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm not picking on anybody else, but I just wanted that's to do something that's a good idea. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Not only Don't attendance, quiz but quizzes. I think that's a good idea. Anyway, that's, I just, I, I'm hoping that by portraying it as Timothy that that maybe it would, you know, give the context better and kind of communicate what that, what that letter was about. Amen. A note from a theater student. That was really good. First a theater all, student. Yeah. And then uh, theater auditions are open to faculty and staff. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Duly noted. So what do you think are some of the key takeaways from Paul's mentoring of Timothy? You spent... Uh, obviously, there was quite a bit of time there, and that's one of the most fascinating studies between Paul and Timothy is the, uh, just that discipleship relationship they had between each other. So uh, what do you think are some key takeaways? Yeah, good. There is a lot. There's a lot in the New Testament about Timothy. And, um, what, what, and I, I've actually recently been studying this pretty, pretty seriously, um, leadership and mentoring. Um, there's actually... Um, the scholars out there will know that there's the Paul-Timothy leadership development model. 
And, and so what, what you see in, Paul, in, in Timothy's life is, is, you know, first of all, you see this milestone of Timothy being invited to apprentice with Paul, invited to go with him from Acts 16. And um, it's really fascinating to look at that passage. It's just a few verses, but it gives reasons why Paul chose Timothy. And, and uh, when you look at it in the context of, you know, Paul and Barnabas had just split. And, and so I believe, I believe Paul was at this place where he realized uh, he needed to start thinking about raising up uh, the next generation of leaders who could continue the work of the ministry. And so there's that major milestone of, of uh, Timothy being asked to go. And then if you really, if you look at it, you look at the dates we have, you look at when the letters were written and all that kind of stuff, you realize he, he apprenticed with Paul for almost 20 years, probably around 17 or 18 years. So, uh, then, then came the milestone of 2 Timothy, where I think 2 Timothy, he was basically saying, Timothy, okay, I'm done. You, you take the baton now. Okay, and then so in between there, like I said, uh, as Timothy, you know, Paul would, Paul would uh, show Timothy how to, how to proclaim the gospel, how to plant churches, and then he began to leave Timothy in places to help him sort through problems. And he would, he would also send Timothy to different places. We have all kinds of footnotes in the New Testament about this. And it's really a fascinating, beautiful leadership development uh, study. And kind of build on that, is there... <clears throat> so Paul was, was older, uh, like physically older. He, he was an older in age. Uh, is there uh, a place where that's required? Would you say that it's better for the, the disciple, the discipler to be older in age, not just in, in spiritual maturity? Can you flip those? Can you flip that, you know, where the, the younger in age is more spiritually mature, discipling an older person? That's a great question. I think <clears throat> there's a lot in the New Testament to support the idea that the older should be teaching the younger. Now, obviously, we all know 50-year-olds who are really at a, at a teenage level in their maturity with Christ. So, I mean, not everybody is a leader. Not everybody is, is equipped to mentor other people. But uh, ideal, ideally, you know, older people just w will have uh, a certain amount of experience. They've been around the block a little bit, and they'll have even just life experience, you know, that will help uh, younger people. Um, so I think that's what you see. That's what you see generally. Uh, like Titus 2 is very clear on this. Uh, that the, the older women are to teach the younger women, the older men are to teach the younger men. And, um, and so I think that's ideal. Um, and I was just thinking about a situation in our own context where <clears throat> we have some younger men who are, who are uh, really growing in their maturity, and um, then they've, they've uh, been in a ministry situation where there are older men, and the older men just kind of just didn't take them seriously. Uh, which is unfortunate because, you know, these are younger, more faithful men, but, uh, and, and they could learn from them, but, but just like human nature or whatever, the older men just, just didn't or won't or something like that. And I've seen that, I've seen that in, in, the, in the context of ministry, so. Okay, last question to, to kind of the, the last layer of this, of really the same question we're talking about. And, and you're talking about the discipleship model and, and Paul, that first milestone where Paul asked Timothy to be his apprentice. Um, I've seen it in context where that has flipped and the apprentice has asked the discipler uh, to kind of take them under their wing. Is that wrong? Is that okay to do? Is it not ideal? Et cetera. Does that make sense? Oh, I don't think it would be wrong. I think it's ideal, actually, for younger people to, say, to admit... <laughs> Look, I need a mentor. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, you know, I, I, and in fact, um, my own story is that I, when I went to seminary, my whole goal was to learn how to teach the Bible. I was, I was a relatively new believer, and I, and I just wanted somebody to teach me how to study and how to understand the Bible. And, and, but while I was there, like a couple weeks after I got there, I met uh, a, a church planter. He was planting a church in Irving, Texas. And uh, <laughs> I basically... Um, I met him through a friend, and, and I just contacted him and said, look, I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, uh, 
I, you know, uh, is, there, is there something I could do at your church or whatever? And I stumbled with how I was asking this. I didn't say, I need a mentor. Will you please, you know, uh, I, just, I just asked him, you know, if I could come and, and be a part of what he was doing. And, and he said yes. And uh, I was, I was uh, an associate under his, under his leadership for 14 years. And I, was, I didn't go to Dallas looking for that. But then as I, as I grew in my understanding of Scripture, I realized that, that that was a Paul-Timothy relationship that marked my life. Um, in fact, I, I had uh, several classes with Howard Hendricks. And Howard Hendricks, I'll never forget, he said, um, my, my last semester there, he said, if I had my way, none of you would leave here and be a senior pastor. And I thought, well, that's, that's me. I, I'm not ready for that. And so I, I had this great relationship with an older a more mature believer, and he mentored me through all kinds of stuff that I, I didn't even know that I needed to know. And so it was a fantastic experience, and, I, and I've, I've really uh, embraced this Paul Timothy model because of my own experience, partly. You know, because it's there in the Scripture, but also because um, my own experience is that, you know, uh, a, men- a mentor is, is a life-changing thing. And I wish... I wish every student here could walk out of here with a mentor who would, who would uh, just help shape your life. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Well, there's, uh, my brain's coming up with like 500 more questions in this, in this topic, but we're running out of time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray us out um, <clears throat> as the praise band comes and joins us to, to close the service. Um, service, that sounded... Yeah, this is not a service. Anyways, praise man's going to come up, and, and if you guys would stand to, to, so we can worship together uh, as, I, as I praise out. Father, we love you so much, and God, I thank you so much for Sean and for his ministry here at Calvary and for his willingness to come and, um, and speak to us this morning. I ask, Father, that you would bless him um, and that you would be with him, that you would grant him wisdom and strength throughout the rest of his day. And I ask that for the rest of us in here. Be with the praise band as they uh, lead us in uh, lifting up songs of praise to you. And uh, Father, we're very grateful for you and for the love you have for us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.